Hi, folks. I hope you're having a good day today. Let me the first off, you know, autism rocks and rolls. Now, before we begin, I must know that I'm not a doctor psychiatrist. If you're starting to diagnose diagnosed with autism, please see a physician. I only speak based on my experiences. I also not write to the credit, that the outro that is found on musicwatloaded.com. I also have a mission today I'd like to tell everyone. The mission of Autism Rocks and Rolls is to take the stigma off of autism and other conditions that many think are disabilities. People on the spectrum are not broken, not need to be fixed. Those who have conditions or abilities not to be pitied. There's nothing to be sorry about. I also have some paid for the following. We have to express our gratitude to AM Vet Center in Bloomington, Indiana, for not only letting us use the building for our gala event, but for all the work they do. AM Vet Center is an event center run by David Cobb. They have hosted many Indiana Special Olympic events, such as Indiana Special Olympics bowling and Indiana Special Olympics basketball. Also, they are full supporters of, of the military because their goal is to enhance any American veteran who has served our country. Be sure to take a look at the work they do. Thank you, Mr. Cobb, for letting us have the building for that night. This, is, this isn't all, however. I'd like to thank our sponsors for our gala event. Special thanks to Top Dog Pet Retreat, Val of the Lights, Wellspring Pain Solutions, Fowler Pumpkin Patch, Benny Flynn, Place for Purpose, Duke Energy, UDWI, REMC, AM Vets, Indiana Oxygen, Indiana Family to Family, Stone Belt, Night Out Promotions, Life Designs, Rockman, Autism Parenting Magazine, Actress Sarah Tomko, Rock on Music Incorporated, GM Charity for Kids, City of Bloomington, Presbyterian Church of Bloomfield, Indiana Women's Group, Reaching High Consulting and Therapy, Hands and Autism, Official Office Easel Promotions, Living Well Home Care, Brian Bogert, CPA Steve Miller Tax Service, Jim Doering, The Bluebird, Party City, Casa Owen County, and Boston Scientific. Thank you guys all. Or thank you all. Our flower, And also with our gala, our flowers for our event will be approved by Mary M. Fl M's Flowers at a greatly discounted price. We greatly appreciate your generosity. And there are some people I'd like to thank. I must first recognize my good friend Temple Grand and C-124, pictures on the ranch from Temple Grand for more information, but she amazingly helped us with flight information and what to do in certain, certain inconvenient situations. Thank you, Ms. Grandin, and as always, you rock. Next, I want to thank Party Marty for letting me be on the radio. I was on the 99.9 .9 New Country Radio Station. It was my first ever radio appearance. It was a great time, and I'm glad I did it. On that same day, I got to speak to my mother's class. Thank you, Mom, for allowing me, allowing me to speak to your class. I hope the students learned something, and I hope I can come back. I also have two new blogs called Picking Up the Phone and the Sugary and the Spicy Side of Me. When I, po when I post it in the show notes, be sure to read and see my create creative side. I also did a networking event. I also did a networking group with the Chambers of Ohio. Thank you for letting me on and meet some great people. And also, I want to be contacted if you uh, want tickets. So contact me at info at autismrocksandrolls.com if you would like to get tickets for our gala event. And since the last episode, I've been on many podcasts. I was on Threat of Enlightenment with Ken Premius, then Wait Podcast with Chris and Luke, Dead America Podcast with Ed Waters, Poison Honey Podcast with, with Menard Gray, and Stallion Podcast with Angus Clara Decombe. These are great podcasts. Be sure to listen to each one. Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear about Wellspring Pain Solutions, so let's get to it. Hello, everybody. This is Mike Glasscott from the Glass in the Afternoon radio program on News Sports Talk 98.7 and AM 1370 and WGCLradio.com. And on behalf of Wellspring Pain Solutions, they're happy to partner with Sam Mitchell and the Autism Rocks and Rolls podcast. Wellspring Pain Solutions applauds Sam's mission statement to eliminate the stigma associated with autism. Here's what we want you to do. Check out the website, wellspringpainsolutions.com. You'll find out which of the four locations is closest to you. You'll get a chance to meet their team of providers and all the services offered at Wellspring. When you're there, now the fun really begins. You'll find the link to Sam's website where you'll find all his podcasts, background information on his guests, as well as all the merch in his merchandise store. You'll be amazed. You'll have fun. You'll enjoy it. All we ask you to do is take a listen and spread the word that autism 
rocks and rolls. All right, folks, you're back. I don't want you to be too nervous to meet these fine people. Now, today for Autism Rocks and Rolls, we are repeating and making history. We are still in England, but for the first time, we are interviewing a play therapist, and that play therapist's name is Jack Mason Goodall. I met him through my speaking gig at Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. He is the founder of Autism Optimism International. This place believes in everyone as they try to see everyone's abilities. I will also say this is a new one for me because I will be learning about play therapy, just like my listeners out there. Let's get to it and welcome Jack. Jack, how you, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Sam. Of course, good to be here. It's good to be here too. Mm-hmm. So my first question to you is, what does having odd... Hold on, let me get there. Okay, here we go. What does being a play therapist mean to you? That's a good question. I thought you were about to ask me, what does having autism mean to me? And I, <laughs> I'm gonna struggle with that one a little bit more. But... um. Being a play therapist, you know, to me, I think there are two really key points to that. One is about this idea that we all learn most effectively when we're having fun. And therapy is is a, a process of learning, whether that is learning how to be happier, whether that is learning social skills, whether that is learning, um, you know, life and self help skills we're gonna learn this most effectively when we're having fun and we tend to have the most fun when we are playing. So all the work I do is about finding things that are gonna be helpful for the people that I'm working with to learn and finding a way to make that learning fun. The second part of it is about then, we learn through the relationships that we have with other people, right? Whether that's through relationships with our parents, relationships with professionals, relationships with our friends. So as a play therapist, I want to be able to create meaningful, fun, accepting, understanding relationships with the people that I work with. Because if I want to help them learn, they need to trust me. They need to enjoy me. They need to feel good about what I have to offer them. And if as a therapist, I'm not offering a relationship that's based on compassion and based on understanding, then I don't believe I can really be doing the best to help the people that I work with. No, you really couldn't because you need to build that bond with the person, whoever you're working with, whether that be still on the spectrum or even not, you got to have that trust. As you mentioned, I don't know if you work with, I don't know if you could work with me because I unfortunately live by the uh, motto DTA. Uh, Don't trust anybody because of the past I've had, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, but it is what it is on the same time, but maybe I could, uh, maybe I could learn to build bonds. I'm still working on that though, to this day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you say something really, really important there, Sam, which is the way that society tends to treat a lot of autistic people means that a lot of autistic people really, really don't trust neurotypicals with good reason. And so I guess I also kind of, part of the reason why I founded Autism Optimism International is because I sort of want to fly the flag for helping neurotypical people learn how to be trustworthy for neurodiverse people. Cause you know, we got a lot of learning to do. You ain't a kid. I mean, I have a lot of learning to do still, and I'm, tw- I'm about 20 years old. I haven't learned any- everything yet. Oh, dude, I am 37. I still feel like I'm just beginning. <laughs> <laughs> you still feel like yeah, you're two years old at points, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, you know, I really love the point that you're raising here because I think you're saying you've got a lot to learn. I'm saying I've got a lot to learn. You know, normally the narrative is, as a neurotypical person, I don't have anything to learn. It's the autistic person who should be doing all the learning. And we really need to change that story. Like there are things that are great for you to learn and there are things that are great for me to learn. And I think, again, that's what play therapy should be about. It's about forming a relationship where we learn from each other, not just me sitting down and making someone press a red button 20 times in a session. Yeah, you just don't, you don't poke the bear 24 seven. Exactly. Now, what were your initial thoughts when you decided you were going to do play therapy for a living? Oh, oh, that's such a good question. Well, you know what? I feel like I decided to do play therapy for a living when I was about 11. I remember I was like one of those kids who just loved playing. Like I would always have these huge imaginary scenarios going on in my head. And I remember when I got to about 11, And a lot of the other kids in my class were kind of growing up and getting more serious. And they they wanted to talk about like girls and dating and they didn't want to play anymore. And I remember feeling heartbroken. I feel like, oh, 
does this mean I'm never going to be able to play again? And so then when I was when I was studying psychology at university in England, I found out about a play therapy scheme um, that a family were running to support their autistic son. And I just decided I wanted to give it a go. And as soon as I got there, as soon as I started like playing with this kid, I was like, oh, yes, this is what I was born to do. I get to play. I get to feel like I'm helping people. I get to bring in kind of the... Um, the theories and the science of my psychology background as well, but I get to do it in a way where I'm having fun. Yeah. That sounds fun. And, and in a way it's a win-win because you're having fun. They're having fun. So you make everyone happy. Why not it, be it? Exactly. Right. If, if we're not making learning fun, what are we doing? Exactly. And you know, you remind me of, I'm just thinking out loud. Have you seen the hmm. movie boss baby? No, you know, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Okay, well, you need to watch it because not the baby, but the older kid. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Tim, you remind mm -hmm. me a lot of him. You, so you definitely need to watch that movie because oh, really? it is you to a T. <laughs> You're talking about creative I, imagination. Oh, my goodness. Watch that, watch that movie. It, I think it's a Disney movie, too. Oh, amazing. I will definitely check that out. Oh, for sure, man. Now, from a play therapist point of view, how do you think an autistic brain operates? Oh, that's a really juicy question. And, you know, I can only comment as a neurotypical person, you know, so I can only comment on, on my observations. Right, and that's what I want you to do. Talk to me about. Yeah. So I think a lot of the autistic people that I work with probably experience the world in a much more intense way that I do. So, you know, maybe like sounds are louder, lights are brighter, you know, touch is a lot more kind of um, intense. So I work with a lot of kids who have a high level of kind of sensory dysregulation. So I think that that obviously impacts how someone feels and, and experiences the world. I also think, um, yeah, you know, and I, I'd be really curious to know how you relate to this, Sam. So many of the autistic people that I work with are... You know, this whole story, this whole kind of myth that autistic people lack empathy, which I just think is such a harmful, ridiculous myth. Because if anything, the autistic people I know are profoundly, profoundly tuned in to how I feel, how the people around them feel. Like they seem even more aware, actually, of the feelings of the people around them than, than maybe I am. I could actually agree with that statement because while I am aware, maybe I just come across gruff. For an example, mm. I'm a very good person. I mean, I'm doing this for, I want to do this for a living to just help out. Yeah. And I want to donate to make a wish foundation. I've always wanted to do that. Always oh, have. Wow. Always I wanted to do that. I still working on doing that, but I can't come across very gruff maybe. So as an example, this may be kind of odd, but this is so true. I am never, and I'm not kidding. I promise you, I won't lie to you. I'm never crying at a funeral. Mm -hmm. Never once. And maybe I will probably one day to someone who I'm really close to, but the people who have uh, kicked the bucket, I'm not like yeah. per se close, close, close to, but I was very close to them. I just wasn't like attached to the hip close. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think that there's something in that too, that with some of the autistic people I know, you know, there's that, there's that real emotional sensitivity and emotional awareness, but there's also not the same kind of, um, not buying into all the social expectations that I buy into. So like crying at a funeral is partly because we feel like we're expected to cry at a funeral. You know, I've worked with kids who will tell me if my breath smells, which maybe a neurotypical person wouldn't do because we're, we're kind of socially trained not to say those things. So I also think that there's a wonderful, um, just like authenticity to a lot of the autistic people I know because maybe these kind of social rules and social expectations um, either don't matter so much or aren't so important or maybe just a little bit harder to, to figure out. Right. Right. And then I agree with you there because some of those aspects are hard because when I was looking at those people not crying, I thought, uh, am I supposed to be crying here? Am I supposed to just like fake 
fake the tears at this point because I don't feel sad. I mean, I'm a little, I don't want to say upset. I mean, I'm a little sad she's gone, but I'm not upset, upset where I want to go, bleh. So should right. I... Should I just fake it? What the heck should I do here? I'm I'm really uncomfortable, not because of the social aspects, just because what am I supposed to play the game and follow along too? Right. Absolutely. And, you know, we talk about the idea of autistic people masking a lot, which is basically like pretending or, or trying to, to sort of fake the things that the neurotypical people around them are doing and that that can actually be really exhausting and really stressful. Correct. But let me ask you this now that I think about it. Hmm. Couldn't you sometimes consider play therapy as masking? Because you're not, and I'm not trying to be rude when I ask this, obviously, no. but you're you're being someone else. And aren't you playing a certain character? Oh, that is such a good, good question. Yeah. And it's something that I'm really, really aware of when I'm working with people, you know, and, and this is true with autistic people, neurotypical people. Uh, we all um, become slightly different versions of ourselves with other people. One of the things that I notice is that when I'm able to work with someone over time and I'm really able to build, build up that trusting bond that we were talking about, then people feel more relaxed to be able to let the mask slip and to be who they really are. So the play therapy is something that, you know, it needs to happen over a period of time. You're not gonna do kind of one session and there's gonna be like a, a magical shift necessarily. It's about showing over time, if I can really show someone like, I really accept who you are. I really enjoy who you are. You don't have to conform to a particular expectation in order for me to enjoy you. Over time, people are able to get more comfortable hopefully able to be more fully themselves. Yeah, just as a relationship and a friendship, it takes time. Exactly. Now, what is the most rewarding and the most difficult part about being a play therapist? Uh, I mean, you know, on one level, the most rewarding part is I just get to have fun <laughs> every day. I get to be a big kid. Um, but I think on a more meaningful level, <laughs> Oops, I just broke my chair. I was obviously jumping up and down too much in excitement there. Um, on a more meaningful level, there's something that feels really, really magical for me about a lot of the work that I do is about helping parents to be able to play with their kids, helping parents to be able to relate to their autistic kids. Because I think a lot of parents who are still struggling with maybe difficult feelings about their children's diagnoses, you know, maybe fears about their children's future, they're unsure about, you know, what sort of direction are their kids' lives gonna go in? And they have these kids who they find really difficult to understand. There's something amazing about being able to help a parent understand their kids and to be able to understand, okay, oh, this is why my child is doing this thing. It's not because they're naughty, it's not because they're ignorant, it's because they're taking care of themselves or they don't understand this thing or this thing is really overstimulating for them. So when I see parents get to that point of being able to connect with their kids and enjoy their kids, oh, I mean, that, that's, yeah, that's where the magic is. Right, and that's where kind of the Disney aspect comes in, right? Where Disney kind of waves the magic wand and mm. they finally feel as if, they can finally do something with them and not have to be like, what the heck do I do here? How do I become, yeah. how do I go into their head, for example? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just thinking, you know, it's about kind of building bridges, isn't it? And, and play is a great way to build bridges between people. When you can get two people playing together, they, they bond, they connect, they start enjoying each other and to help a parent build a bridge with their kid and then to help that kid feel like their parents finally understand them and, and get them and enjoy them is huge. Oh my goodness, that, that is huge. I think maybe I could have used a little play therapy when I was a kid because I bet my parents would have related to me much more than they have. And I'm not saying they were awful parents, like, oh my God, I am the worst parents alive. That's not. I met your mom. She's amazing. I know. She, that's not the case at all. But I totally there were hear at you, times yeah. where, from an outsider's perspective and from my perspective, I think it was tough for her to relate with me yeah. at times. And I think that's every parent, though, to be honest with you. Would you agree with that statement? Absolutely. I would totally agree. You know, I think every parent 
has to really kind of, you know, go beyond themselves to relate to their kid. And especially when their kid is kind of neurodiverse, it's like, you know, I've suddenly been given this, this manual that's in a completely different language, right? And so then I come along and just try to, try to do a bit of gentle, fun translation for everybody. Right, right. It's not like Google translation going blah, 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 blah. It's not doing that really. <laughs> it's just them doing, right. all right, we can go into this. This is what they're doing. Exactly, right? And because, you know, there's this idea uh, you know, I, I kind of have real issues with this word, but there's this idea that autism is a disability. Whereas to me, I guess the way I think about it is everything, like everything that I do makes sense to me because I understand myself. I think everything, you know, for the autistic people I know, my autistic friends, like what they are doing that we call their autism, it makes sense because people are just doing the best thing to, to look after themselves, you know, with what's easy for them, what's difficult for them. And if we can stop looking at behaviors and say like, oh, they're doing this thing because they're autistic and say, oh, they're doing this thing because they're human and they're taking care of a discomfort or they're taking care of a human need or they're overstimulated and trying to regulate themselves, then we can relate to each other as, as humans rather than here's this autistic person. Right. Right. I agree with you there. And you, yeah. And then it comes to a point where you don't have to go full Darth Vader on them in a way. <laughs> yeah. We want to avoid full Darth Vader. Definitely. Yeah. You probably <laughs> need to be more of a Luke Skywalker on them. And that does not mean I'm a Star Wars fan. That just means I just know them because my friend likes to talk about it with me at points and he doesn't like to shut up about it. So well, I know a little bit of Star Wars history, believe me. Well, you know what? I was quite a big Star Wars fan when I was a kid. And, uh, I can do quite a good Yoda impression if you want. Go ahead. Mm. Autism, not a disability, is. Mm. Hey, not bad. I am your father. That's the one I know, but that's it. <laughs> or may the force be with you, but again, not the biggest. Yeah. So what advice would you give to a play therapist if they're thinking about being a play therapist? How can they improve on being the best play therapist they know? I know not be you exactly, but improve on their play therapy. Yeah, totally. I think what's really, really important for, for anyone who is working with, with like helping people, whether they are a psychologist, a play therapist, a speech and language pathologist, um, an occupational therapist, what's really important is to remember that you are creating a relationship with the person that you are helping. And in order for that relationship to be really helpful, you need to look at what are your issues? Because so often when we're in relationships with people, they do something and it upsets us. And then we can't really be helping in that moment. If we're feeling upset about what someone is doing, we're not helping them anymore. So I know when I did my original play therapy training, I had to do a ton of therapy. I really had to look at, okay, why would I get upset if this kid refuses to play my game? Why would I get upset if the child that I'm working with has a tantrum for my whole session? You know, can I be able to maintain this really like open, compassionate, empathic mindset for the whole time when I'm working with someone, especially if that person is really different to me? Because that can be really challenging when we're with people who are different and we don't understand them. So that would be my biggest piece of advice is you got to start by looking at yourself and you got to get really, really good at knowing like, okay, I can't get my feelings involved here. I need to find a way to be able to be comfortable and accepting of the difference in the person that I'm working with. Right. And I can agree with well, first of all, let me just say you are a big kid for sure. I can definitely tell that already. <laughs> Thank you. I am mean, playing my game, really, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lordy. No, oh, I'll be making fun of you with that for the rest of my life. I'm a very, I like to mess around <laughs> with people. So that's one thing I'll probably do with you. Oh, you are welcome to make fun of me as much as you want. Please do. All right, cool. Thanks. And second, though, on the flip side of the serious side aspect, don't you think, though, and I'm not, when I do these, as I said, not being rude, but 
that's not fair at the same time that you can't have your own feelings involved. So are there ways where we can have our feelings involved? Or totally. do you have to be a one-centered sin or one-sided person? No, we absolutely want to be like a really full, really real person. I guess what I mean is, if I am here to help you and say we've got like two hours together once a week, there are other places where I can go and where I can get grumpy or where I can go and I can be impatient or unhappy, but I get two hours with you. I want to try to make those the highlight of your week. And if I can do that by leaving some of my more maybe difficult feelings outside, then I want to do that. Now, that said, there totally have been times where something has happened. Like, <laughs> I, remember, um, uh, I remember quite a few years ago, someone who I knew had died and I was really close to them and I was still feeling really sad about that. And I talked about that with the, the young adult that I was working with. And I let them know, look, you know, I'm here today. I'm really excited to be with you. And I'm also still feeling really sad because, you know, my friend died really recently. The, well, did that person like have your back at the end of at, during the session? Or mm -hmm. what? Well, that's some good news. I mean, that myth of being where we can't lack empathy and compassion is getting exposed. It's kind of yeah. going off the chain. That's why I was asking that because that's showing, hey, this myth where they're saying they like no empathy, they can't have any feelings, right. they're just, a, they have a needle, they have a needle, they're prim and proper. Mm, try again because you got a, you got someone over here who just cared about a, a complete person's stranger who just died so try again absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely and you know here's what's really interesting sam is um this this young adult that i was working with he actually doesn't communicate with speech so it's not as if he then turned around and was like you know asking me how i was feeling or you know doing the kind of like spoken empathy stuff that we might normally expect from people but he was so like gentle and tender and sweet with me during that session and you know and absolutely you know he I totally believe he understood what I had said he definitely understood how I was feeling and because we had this trusting relationship right he then wanted to be able to reciprocate you know, it's not just that I'm there taking care of him, but actually I'm sure it felt nice for him to be able to offer something to me. And that's good. He offered his, he kind of offered his services in a way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Now I do want to transit here into actually how I met you, which is the Griffin Promise Autism Conference. So you see yes. me going there a long time. So how did you hear about the Griffin Promise Autism Conference? Hmm. So um, the Griffin Promise is an, it's an amazing um, therapy clinic in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and I work with their therapeutic team. So they provide play therapy, speech and language therapy, I think some occupational therapy as well um, for autistic kids in, in, in the community. It's named the Griffin Promise because um, the woman who set up the center, her name is Laurie Frederick. She has an autistic son called Griffin. And I worked with Griffin, gosh, uh, maybe 12, 12, 13 years ago, because I, I used to work at a, a, a center in the USA. So I worked with Griffin a long, long, long time ago, had a great time with him. Um, and then I stayed in touch with his mom. And then when she set up this clinic, we carried on talking. And then she brought me in to do training and some professional supervision for all her staff. So I've been working with them for a while and then she was telling me about this conference and we just thought, yeah, it would be really great for me to be able to come over and talk about what I do. And you did. And how, just out of curiosity, how would you describe Lori Frederick from your perspective? Oh, she is one of my favorite people. She's incredible. She's this amazingly driven mom. You know, she's done phenomenal things to support her son. And then to kind of take all of the knowledge and the skills that she had learned supporting Griffin and to want to open a clinic to help other kids, I just think is, it's a really, it's a beautiful thing. It really, really is. And she's awesome too. She seems very fun. Yeah, I, she The is. first time I met her, believe it or not, she was actually like dancing, believe it or not, like 
towards me. I thought, okay, well, we can tell she's fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the thing that I really remember from your speech at the conference, Sam, was you and your mom dancing on the stage. I loved that. Yeah, and believe it or not, though, I, I'm actually trying to commit, sir. I'll be honest with you. I mm-hmm. wasn't a fond of the dancing. I like dancing, don't get me wrong, but yeah, it, the dancing wasn't me, per se. Right. So what right. I thought we could do is, what I wanted to do was, um, I'm a big rock and roll fan, always have nice. been. Yeah. So I thought I could you try to get the best guitar solo and instead of the dance. Ooh. That I think would have been a lot cool. more fun than that. But at the same time, we kind of, agreed with that and just gave it a shot but yeah it still it still worked and i'm glad it did but i think from my personal perspective i'd rather do a guitar so i think that'll get more involved but that's just my opinion so hey you know you hit on a really key point there which is about motivation and interest and that's another really central part of play therapy which is about again this idea of like we're going to be much more likely to do something if there's an element to it that interests us or motivates us so here, like, you know, if it had been a, say, like a, a rock song with a big guitar solo, that, that's your thing, right? That, so you would have wanted to do that even more. And that's something I'm really mindful with the, the autistic people I work with is it's not that I'm going to sit you down and get you to do algebra because that's what I'm interested in. No, it's about saying, okay, what are you interested in? And can I then create something based on what you're interested in that also helps you practice a skill that could be useful for you. Right. And in the speech, what really made me fascinating was it at first I figured, well, it's kind of odd, but it's kind of cool at the same time. I would never dismay at your sessions, but it was really cool when you said that it takes sometimes 21 year olds to take tickles and yeah. all those touches in order for them to get them. But I thought hmm, I'm glad there's someone willing to do that because you gotta admit i bet it's been odd at times or felt odd at times yeah because you know it goes back to that like social conditioning idea doesn't it and we get conditioned into these ideas of like it's okay for like a little kid to play tickles and to do squeezes and stuff like that but once they get like beyond five six seven eight we shouldn't be doing that anymore there's a ton of teenagers and adults with autism that i work with who still really enjoy that kind of sensory play and that's what I admire, that you're willing to go in there and do that because, to be honest, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not a physical touch person, but I don't know if I could do that because of that social conditioning. Right, and right. I'm, but I'm glad you're willing to do that. I'm, and I'm just giving you comments for that because it'd be a very challenging aspect for me to do it. Believe me, I mean, it's definitely would just feel really odd. And just, I think my skin recall because of the uncomfortableness I feel, not because of, them not because of them just because of this oh. social conditioning rule and i know i have to over pass that but it'd be hard for me to do but i think i know i could do it yeah well and i think that's real credit to you sam and i like that awareness that that would be difficult for you and i think you know two thoughts one is obviously you know any kind of physical contact like that it's really important that we do it consensually it's really important that we do it in a very um aware way you know so that we're not inviting kind of any sort of inappropriate touch or anything like that but the other thing that i think you're talking about here this sort of where our skin might crawl or where we might feel uncomfortable that goes back to my point of okay well then we need to be looking at you know where am I getting in the way with this? Like, you know, what am I thinking or what am I believing that is going to make this interaction more difficult? Because that's where I want to try to change the way that I'm thinking so that I can really help and really respond to the person who I'm with. Right. And you got to, you got to find what clicks there. You got to find their touch, not your own touch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about what works for you, what is respectful for you, what is motivating for you. And yeah, I, I want to be able to offer that. Right. Now, what about that conference? What did you enjoy the most about that part? Did you enjoy the booze, the speeches, my speech? What did you enjoy there? Like, what was your favorite part about that conference? You know, I mean, I really, really did love your speech, Sam, because you know, I think I said this when I was up on the stage too, like it's so important 
that we have autistic people speaking at these events because otherwise it's just a bunch of neurotypical people deciding how autistic people ought to be treated and actually you know people like you need to be really front and center in these conversations so I was so excited that you were there I thought it was amazing and you know I mean I, I can even remember a specific moment in your speech where I was just like yes this is it this is what we need to be hearing and it was the bit where you were like you said um you know I want people to underestimate me I want people to underestimate me so that I can prove them wrong and I just thought that was that was so fantastic you know credit to you man for, for saying that and also just so amazing and inspiring because there were so many parents of autistic people at that conference so amazing for them to be able to hear that and to be able to like to be able to have some optimism right and that's why I called my organization Autism Optimism International because there is a ton of pessimism as soon as we mention autism and we need to start changing that we need to start helping people have optimistic stories of what lives for autistic people can look like. Ryan, I agree. But well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for ask for the speech. Please underestimate me. I appreciate that. But there's a reason why and I'll tell you why. So I've been mm. underestimating my whole entire life. You could probably imagine. Yeah. So instead of as a child, it was negative and all this underestimation. I kind of make this life of mine, this confusing life at points, a very positive light. So now what I had to learn is, wait a minute, if I can prove people wrong and they do underestimate me, I can, I can do something good for this. So instead of being like, they're underestimating me, Ugh, this stinks. I be like, go ahead. Because what, what's going to happen at the end of the day is you're going to see something that you didn't expect. And yeah. I know this may be the brat coming in, but I need to prove you wrong. Well, you know what? A healthy dose of being a brat can be a good thing. Because exactly. it can get us to fight, it can get us to like push back against, you know, systems that really don't work for us. Right. And then they can finally change and see that system is working for me, whether it's, whether society deems it reasonable or not. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have definitely been a brat at many times in my life. The reason why I've got to where I am is because I pushed back against a ton of things that weren't working for me anymore. And that has been one of the most useful, like, parts of myself right, <laughs> is I that think, rebellious side. Yeah, and I can be a very blunt and re rebellious person where I don't deem the society rules because why would I if society's been kind of using me, I feel as if, for the past 15 years. Mm. So the past has kind of brought me to the present, but mm -hmm. I'm kind of glad I kind of went through that dark history because I get to get underestimated and as odd as it sounds to say it, it feels good to get underestimated. Right. Because it sounds like that helps you really get in touch with the part of you that, that wants to prove yourself, that really knows what you're, you're able to do. Correct. You, you're nailing a man to a T. Now, out of curiosity, how, what were your initial thoughts of me when I first met you, when, I was eating that when I, we were eating that hotel breakfast together? And may I say that hotel breakfast was pretty good. For a hotel. Yeah, it, was. it was. Yeah, you know, I really loved that. Um, so for everyone listening, you know, um, I was staying in the same hotel as, as Sam and his mom. And I was, it was the morning of the conference and I was just having my breakfast. And I was feeling quite nervous about doing my talk later in the day. So I was kind of sitting, having my breakfast, having my coffee, feeling quite anxious. And then this incredibly friendly guy just comes over and he's like, hey, are you Jack? Are you speaking at the conference? I was like, yeah, and, and that was you. And then you introduced yourself and, and your mom came over and then we all sat and we had breakfast together. And I think um, my first impression was just about like how friendly you were. You know, you were just immediately so open and cheerful and interested. And then the other thing was, I was really glad you get, guys came over because it was a nice distraction from sitting there feeling nervous. Well. I'm glad you, I'm glad we got to distract you, first of all. And well, I'll tell you the reason what hit me was I knew I was speaking and I didn't know if anyone else was speaking. But hmm. then it was when Lori came over and said, virtual speaker, I thought, well, since we're doing the same thing, I just better out of respect really introduce myself. And it was just, I think it was just be kind of rude, you know, just to be over there and eating all the breakfast without 
being without meeting the other speaker, without eating my fellow speaker, I should say. So the least I yeah. can do is just go over there and say hi. And I'm like I've said, I've had social anxiety, so I was nervous meeting you. So it was kind of a nervous, nervous, nervous situation for everyone. Well, you suddenly didn't show it. You just seemed kind of warm, engaging, welcoming. I, I really enjoyed that breakfast. Yeah, I definitely there. There are days where I do mask it, though. I'll be 100 percent honest. But yeah. as you said, the mask is slipping. So that's always some good news. But it was really, like I said, just out of respect and just to spread the word about the podcast I'm doing too, all the work I'm doing. Right, which is so brilliant. So brilliant. That's awesome, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we met. Believe me, I think, I think fate has its way some days and I think fate was meant to happen that day. Totally, you know, because again, like, you know, when I was sitting there, when, when I was talking to you, you and your mom at breakfast and hearing about the work that you do, and then when I heard you speak, and then um, again, like to everyone listening at the conference, we all had like little booths outside in this kind of entrance hall. Sam's was kind of around the corner from mine. But every now and then I'd kind of keep popping across to go have a chat with him, him and his mom. Um, yeah, it's just that the more I got to know you, the more I got to know your mission. I mean, obviously Temple Grandin is someone who I have profound respect and admiration for. So when I heard about your connection to her, I was blown away. That was really exciting um yeah I, I just everything you were saying just sparked so much interest and so much excitement for me right and speaking of that, i have an idea with temple i think mm -hmm. what you should do after this and yeah i'm not doing this to push you i think she'd actually love what you were doing um find okay. her um email online we can't give her anything private just out of respect of but course find her email find anything you can online about her and tell her the work you're doing because from my personal perspective with her, I think she'd enjoy what you're doing. I really, oh, really that's, do. That's awesome. You I tell her, I her your view that. and how it would go because she's definitely one of the coolest people I ever met for sure. I'm not, she's a pretty, she's a pretty cool person and she does have a lot of respect. I mean, there are times where she doesn't like truly get what another person's doing just, just because it's, there's multiple around there. But I think this, once in a life thing is that's going around she'd love to meet you but that's just i said my opinion i could be wrong but i think you should give it a try because the least thing you could do is ask because what i did with my was i just asked straight up and i think maybe if you ask her straight up it may work and just well, tell you know me that might that might that might pull you a plug there yeah there you go i'll just be like sam sent me he says we'll get on <laughs> exactly now, I do want to talk about more play therapy. So can you define play therapy in your own words? Yeah, I can. And I, you know, and this is my personal definition, and there could be many, many different definitions, but this is what it means to me, which is helping someone learn the skills to live their best life in a way that is playful, fun, and respectful. Sure, I can, that's a great one. I think it's fun, you have respect for each other. And as I keep saying, it is a win-win. Yeah, and I think it's really important that, that, you know, that we're aware that the idea of someone's best life could be totally different from person to person. Right, I, it's kind of cool. It, it reminds you of something I did on Facebook a while back ago. And it's kind of corny, but I like to do them. It said, pick your favorite vacation. Like vacation one was this, vacation two was this, vacation right. three was this, vacation four was this, and vacation five was this. And what I've learned is you should have seen the variety. There were yeah. some of them got five, they were four, one, two, and they each involved, as I said, many different items. One involved a pool, one involved a jacuzzi, one involved a hot tub, one involved a fire in your house, a fire with a good book. And there were some that said that I thought that ain't me. That's they're dumb for that. That was my initial <laughs> thoughts. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. I shouldn't say that. I don't promote this on my podcast. That's them. That's who they are. They're nice, being warmed by a fire and a good book. That's them. That's not me. I prefer to be at an amusement park or at Cedar Point where there's roller coasters and there's a beach by it, or at Florida where there's a beach by it. And he, right. and I just that's who I am. And my mother is a little different. Her perspective is or her dream vacation is a log cabin near a lake but my dad's is a little different yeah. too he's a type of guy who likes me by the beach and 
a nice hotel, good food, and a great fishing trip. That's honestly him. Okay. I know it sounds of like a long and really long and corny example, but I thought that's just me saying that's who they are. I can't change who I can't change that. I'm gonna be myself. That's who I am. That's my vacation. Maybe I could join their vacation, but I wouldn't want to do it every day. But that's just who they are. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is this is what I love about you, Sam. You're this is so brilliant because this is totally what I'm talking about. You know, I love how you went through that process of initially kind of judging someone else's choice and then realizing like, oh, actually that's for them. It doesn't have to be for me. It's for them. So I want them to have the best. Right. And, and there you know, are times where I join them. For example, right. my papa, my grandfather is, believe it or not, a golf ball hunter at, t- at times. He likes to go in the oh, woods wow. and golf ball hunt uh-huh. as a hobby. And the first time I did it, I thought, okay, this is dumb. This is dumb. I'm getting itch weeds. I'm getting all itchy. But then the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. And now, right. believe it or not, it's a summer tradition of ours where each summer I make sure we go golf ball hunt. It's not, as I said, because I just don't want to go golf ball hunt, but it's to spend time with him. It's to spend some quality family time with my grandfather, who I don't want to say doesn't have long, but whose time is limited. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You know, and, and that's exactly what I'm talking about with this idea of like, you know, relationships that build up over time and trust that builds up over time. And being able to kind of really understand someone else's world and what someone else enjoys. So what you're talking about there, going golf ball hunting with your, your granddad is an almost exact parallel of something that I might do with one of the, the kids that I work with, where maybe what they love to do is to line up blocks. And they do that over and over again, many, many times a day. And there's something that's kind of soothing and regulating for them about that. But for me, it might not be my first choice of activity, but if I go and I do it and I decide to find something to enjoy about it, it builds up a relationship and a trust with that kid so that then they can be a little bit more open to me. And then maybe I can offer them something that could be useful for them to learn. So I, yeah, I love this. Thank you. And there's an example of that too. With Christmas, I, when I was a child, I used to line up my toys, like, because I was a very orderly person, because mm-hmm. I'm the type of person who wants to remember how what's an order I got. That I'm like, okay, I got the Hershey's here. Now we got this Wii game because I don't remember. Mm-hmm. I want to remember the order. But unfortunately, I've had it grown up since then. But I still want to keep that aspect of me because it makes me feel better. Because I don't want to look at this big main event quilt I got or this big main event amusement park tickets I got. And then re- remind myself I got that first instead of the Hershey's. Because I'm the type of person who's like, I remember my Christmas presents. I got the Hershey's, this, this, mm-hmm. this. And the big finale was this. I feels like I'm telling a story, but that's what I, makes me feel comfortable. And yeah. I had it grown up. But when I grown up, I realized I couldn't do that. It was a really hard feeling because, as I said, it gave me this unique but odd soothing feeling. But I learned to cope mm-hmm. with it and I still do it. But now, since it's become a digital world, I am doing digital by taking pictures of the order. Nice. So I still yeah. keep that, I guess, child instinct in me. Right. And I think, you know, what you're talking about there too, is you, you called it soothing. This idea that we all have things that we do to soothe ourselves. Like one of mine, like I'm sitting on a swing office chair right now. And I kind of just like swing backwards and forwards on it quite often while I'm talking. There's something that's soothing to me about that. And, you know, for some of the autistic people I know, it gets called stimming which I don't particularly like as a word because I think it sounds really medical, but stimming could be like flapping your hands or stimming could be saying the lines of your favorite song over and over again, or lining up blocks or, you know, touching all the corners of a room before you leave it. And there's this idea that's out there that only autistic people stim and neurotypical people don't, and that stimming is bad because it's like a sign of autism. And so if we stop it, we've somehow made our kids less autistic. And I, I think that that's really damaging. And so the work that I do is about saying, well, actually everybody stims and stimming is really just about resting. It's about soothing ourselves and taking care of ourselves. And I don't want to take away from my child their ability to soothe themselves. Right. That's really, really important. If anything, I want to show them that I'm going to do it with them. And that's awesome that you do. But I'll be honest with you. If it was the favorite song line, 
And it was a Disney song, which is Frozen Let It Go. I think I have to kill the person, honestly, <laughs> because I, I get too annoyed. I'd be like, shut up, like do something else. Right. And so, again, that's why it's really important that as therapists, we deal with our own stuff first. Yeah, I'd be but like, you, know when you that- gotta be kidding me. I've heard this. Can we can you sing something else? Can you sing something better, such as uh, be prepared by the Lion King? That might be it's Disney. Can you try that? Oh, no. That is a good song. But you know what? When, when Frozen came out and it's the same with Encanto now, when Frozen came out, nearly every kid that I worked with for like the next two years loved the song let it go <laughs> it was just I, I sang that song till I was blue in the face for two years or in the, or in or in Elsa's case white in the case oh very good I see what you did there now out of curiosity what are some of the tools you use during a play therapy session like do you have a certain tool you use do you have certain plays they like what do you use Mm, yeah well yeah I guess yeah tools I mean the, the a big tool was really what I was just talking about this idea of you know again it, it generally we talk about people talk about stimming at Autism Optimism International we use a different word we call it resting and for us that stands for when someone's doing a repetitive exclusive self-soothing tactic right it means rest so typically people stop kids from stimming from resting and we're like well the first tool that we want to use is we want to let them rest because rest is important and actually I'm going to go rest with them I'm going to do what they are doing because that helps me understand them helps them feel safe with me it helps them feel like they're not the only person in the world who likes doing that particular activity and it really, really builds trust so that is one of the first and most important tools that we use you know is letting our kids rest and resting with them right and resting as always say that's a good aspect i mean i think there are times where i rest my tool is i shut down with the headphones and listen to music nice yeah i mean i do a very similar thing for me it's podcasts right um well you got one to check out autism rocks and rolls oh i think i've heard of that i I think it's done by this really cool guy that i know i know right yeah Yeah, i should probably check it out (laughs) um uh i'd say that's one i would say another thing is about um really really creating a a calm environment for our kids because you know like i was saying at the start of the the podcast loads and loads of kids have like quite a high level of sensory dysregulation and like especially if you think about what schools are like where there's a ton of other children and there's posters on the floor and there's neon on the well hopefully there's not posters on the floor hopefully there's posters on the wall um there's like neon lights flashing. There's, you know, kids playing outside in the playground. There's like a ton of stuff that's really, really distracting and then makes it really difficult for that kid to focus on, on the teacher or the, or the adult who's there to support them. So another thing that we do is we help parents really think about, okay, how can you create a low stimulation environment for your child so that it's A, you know, relaxing for them and B, helps it make it easy for them to be able to focus on you rather than a million other things that are competing for their attention. Mm -hmm. And from a personal standpoint, I think the way to do is to hop, as I say, hop into their world for a few, for a while. And here's, there's an example of that too. I know someone who shall remain nameless. Her, Mm -hmm. she's an autistic mother. Her daughter loves, and I mean, loves, I've seen it in like first eye loves Christmas lights. She is non-speaking. And I don't mm-hmm. say nonverbal anymore because of the conference, believe it or not, I went to. Yeah. And she loves Christmas lights. And I think her mom has hopped into her world and looked at the lights with her, talked to her about the lights even, and they're bonding. So Brilliant. if you're bonding with your child, why are you complaining, people? Exactly. And then if you think about how that's going to feel for that little girl, oh, I, I don't know if she's little, sorry, but, but for that girl, um, how amazing that's going to feel like that her mom gets it, right? That she's not on her own now enjoying the Christmas lights. She's actually got someone to share that with. That's that's huge. So then, yeah. yeah. I agree. I mean, when I get, when I think when I was a child and I got popped into my world, there's someone who actually cared, whether that be a peer. I didn't have, a pe- I didn't have many peers back then, obviously, but I had mm. little peers I mean, once in there who kind of left and moved. But when they cared, I thought, this is great. 
can this happen every day? Or why can this happen yeah. to me when I was two? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you were asking about tools and, you know, part of it is about resting with our kids, allowing them to rest. Part of it is about helping manage their sensory environment. Part of it is about really, really like being eager and keen to explore and understand their world. And another part of it is really what we're talking about here, like this whole mindset shift from I'm here because you need to change and you need to be different to I'm here because I want to understand you and connect to you. Because when we can do that, right, that transforms everything. It helps us both have a lot more fun. It also helps me feel much safer to the person I'm working with, that they're not feeling like I'm pressuring them to have to be different. And for all of us, when we feel safe, we are much more likely to step outside of our comfort zone and try doing something new. So if I want to help someone learn a new skill, the first and most important thing is to not try to change them, is to just try to understand them, relate to them, and connect to them. Right. And as you said, relate. That's the key word in this. Relate, yeah. relate, relate. It's hard for any other person to relate, but when someone can, even for a few seconds, it's a miracle and it makes us feel good. I'm and I'm speaking for those who cannot speak and those who can speak. I'm telling you, it's like James Brown once said in his song, Wow, I feel good. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, you know, and it's so meaningful to hear you say that, Sam. Um, and I work with a lot of non speaking autistic people, and I, I really love that you use the term non-speaking rather than non-verbal because just because someone doesn't communicate with speech, You can thank the conference mean... for that because I, yeah. I've i said non-verbal until then. I thought your point, I think who someone said, oh, it was probably someone else. I don't think it was you, it may have been you. Someone said that I thought well, that makes so much more sense. So they're not non-verbal because they can't hear you. They just don't yeah. have a voice. But right. at the end of the day, I mean, I know it may be hard to not have a voice because I would like to have my voice at the end of the day, but I understand hmm. that if I lost it, I think that maybe I could have more meaning to myself because it can make people get their attention. Yeah. You know, I, this is one of the, again, in terms of these kind of mindset shifts from I'm not here to change you. I'm here to understand you. I'm here to relate to you. Everybody communicates, but not everybody communicates with spoken language. And so all of the non-speaking children and adults I work with are able to communicate. Now, sometimes it's harder for us to understand them. We need to work harder to understand, okay, right, this particular facial expression or this particular behavior or this particular um, action is this person telling me something really meaningful? And it's important that I pay attention to that because we expect people to communicate the way that we communicate. And then we really ignore what they are showing us. And that's not going to help anybody feel closer to us. Mm -hmm. and I, to there's a story with that even. I, it kind of hits home to me. There's, yeah. I'm a big, you can, I don't know if I told you when I was there, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. And one of oh, my, you did. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I didn't know, but one of my favorite characters, he's named the fiend. He uh, didn't speak. He wasn't, he was, he wasn't playing someone who was autistic and not speaking. He just didn't speak because that was his character. Mm. And he, what well, one thing he did was kind of hits home with me was he didn't say anything, but he pointed at the WrestleMania sign, like, like up there like this. Yeah. And you could tell he was communicating. He was telling that person, I want you at WrestleMania. He didn't say it, but what is on the spectrum pointed pointed at family feud, for example. Next thing you know, they're at fam next thing you know, they're trying to apply for family feud. Right. There you go. There you go. You know, behavioral scientists reckon that at least 70% of our communication is nonverbal. And that's for people who who speak. So even for us, yes, you know, I'm using words to talk to you, but I'm taking in your facial expression. I'm taking in your body language. I'm taking in the tone of your voice, the speed of your words, like all of these things that are helping me to really understand you. 
if I only had the words that you were using, think how often we misunderstand people when they write emails or text messages. Right. Because I, I have a friend who sometimes misses and instead of saying half, like H-A-V-E, sometimes she'll mm -hmm. say A-H-A-L-F. And then you have to next oh, thing right, you know, yeah, you have yeah. to play, next thing you know, you have to play solve the puzzle. And <laughs> I'm at times I'm thinking, really? But then I understand again, that's who she is. She can't help it. Right, right, absolutely. And when we do the work to reach out and to understand it, again, just like you were saying, it helps us relate, relate, relate. When we've got that relationship, then, you know, there, then there's so much, there's so much potential. Uh, yes, sir. Now, obviously, while this sounds good, there are going to be some people who probably listen to this may not agree with us and don't like play therapy. So my question is, how have you had anyone not agree with the concept of play therapy? And if you have not, what have you told them? Totally. Yeah. Because, you know, this isn't, this isn't for everybody because I think, um, I think sometimes the idea of playing is really, really challenging because as adults, we don't play and we kind of get um, conditioned out of playing once we stop being children. So a lot of the parents who I work with and the parents who I train, they initially find it really, really difficult to get back in touch with that playful side to themselves. I think as well that sometimes, um, sometimes people find it very difficult to let go of needing the person that they are with to be different. Because I think that takes a lot of a lot of work on our part, right? It takes a lot of courage to kind of really look at, okay, why do I need that person to be different? What is triggering to me about who they are? Like we we got to kind of really sit with some hard truths about ourselves, and that's not always easy. No, it's so, not easy because I mean society we as much as i don't like society i've learned i have to give into society a little bit at least case in point you have you, we have to be an adult now it seems like based on what you're telling me, you had the coolest job of life but there are some people out there who don't like their job who try to handle yeah. these life aspects getting married but i don't see a problem with coming back to your inner child going to an amusement park that's being a child. You're having fun yeah. with this roller coasters, these games, all these amazing inner child around. You can be, you don't have to stand up still, walk around like all puff. You can go and have fun. I would, I wish I'd see a 40 year old man run down to run down to go on his favorite roller coaster at times. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm like, gosh, I wish that we got taught in college and university how to stay in touch with our inner child. I, I wish we did. I think it would make a huge difference in the world. But I think, you know, doing that, doing this process that I'm talking about with play therapy, you know, really being able to put aside um, our needs, that's, that's an incredibly courageous act to do. And it kind of requires us to trust that if we just go with relating, if we just go with understanding, if we just go with having fun, that good things will come of that. Right, and, and, and that I get difficult. the opportunity to do that. I have an eight-year-old cousin, and each time I'm with him, I try to bring back an inner child of me. I try my best to. Uh, good for you. Good but I you. also understand that we have to be an adult. I do understand. I think there's some parts of adults we have to do. I mean, we have to get a job. We have mm. to we have to have a house. We have to live. We have to live our life still. But you can take a break from your life. There are the beauty of America and a beauty from Brit British, I hope, is you can take a break from your life that you're having and just get out of that and be the child that you once were. You can turn back the time. Right. Absolutely. You can find little pockets in your life where you can go and have fun. And maybe even some of the stuff that we think has to be really serious, we could find ways to make that a bit more fun. One of, one of my things is when I do my taxes, which is a job that I used to absolutely hate. And then I realized, like, I'm really musical. I really love singing. If I sing 
my taxes. So I'm like, 34 pounds and da, 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 you know? <laughs> like I'll sing the numbers to myself as I do it. It makes it so much more fun. And I, I get it done and I enjoy it more. Exactly. Maybe my mom will take that advice when she hears this. <laughs> she's You're a welcome. big music person and big singer person. So yeah, I hear her sing when she's doing work. It's half the time. It's funny. My favorite yeah. thing to do that I'll tell you is in the car when we're doing nothing, she'll sometimes sing. I just like to sneak out the phone and record her just to embarrass her. Oh, excellent. And she, oh, excellent. the best part is she, she has not learned. She has, she will never learn that you better be in a, If I'm going to be in the car, you're going to act singing to get some likes and hits and uh, show people how crazy you are. I'm going to record that button. <laughs> does she have a secret tiktok account that you've set up for her uh no i she does not have a tick she has one for podcasting but i mainly post it on facebook okay okay cool so if you ever all around on facebook and you see my mother dancing and it's on the car don't be surprised it's me hitting the record I'll button be, sneaking yeah it. i'll be able to picture that now all right now out of curiosity you were talking about this psychology so i'm curious how did you get into the psychology field so that again it goes back a long long way so um you know when i was a teenager i was doing a lot of theater and i was thinking that i was going to go to theater school i was going to be an actor or a singer and then when i was like i think 16 um my school did i don't know if you have the same system in america or in england we call it work experience which is like for a week you take a week off school and you go and kind of like volunteer in a particular industry to get experience and see if like that's something that you then want to go into. So I went and I did my work experience volunteering with a charity that, um, that a friend of mine set up. Um, and it's a charity that works with adults with um, profound and multiple learning differences. And it does kind of, it's a really great charity. They do great work. So they do like art therapy, drama therapy, music therapy, like all this really creative stuff for these adults who've got, you know, a, a lot of difficulties in their lives. So I volunteered with that charity and it was like this cool place where I could see like all of my theater skills were really, really useful, but were useful to help people. And it felt much more important than um, standing up on a stage and, and, you know, getting applauded five nights a week. So I had this real change of heart and I thought, well, actually, what really fills me up and brings me joy is, is helping people. So I decided that doing a psychology degree would be the best route to that because that could open up a lot of doors for training in different things. I was originally thinking I might be a drama therapist, but then, you know, while I was studying, I found out about play therapy and was like, Oh, this is it. This is the thing that I want to be doing. And I'm glad I think it led to a great path at the end of the day. I'll tell you that. Oh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Now, I do want to talk more about your building, Autism Optimism International. So in your opinion, what is special about Autism Optimism International? What is special about it? I think, first of all, is the fact that we are, we're flying the flag for optimism, right? We're really bringing that to all the work that we do. I think that the thing that is really, really uh, special about what we do is we don't say that there's just one way to help people or that there's one way to support people so we work with families we work with other professionals we work with um companies with other businesses who have neurodiverse employees and what we're really doing is for each person that we work with it's about finding out okay for this family for that parent for that kid what are they interested in? What do they want to be able to do? What do they feel able to do? And working out something personalized for them, for a professional who's working with other autistic kids where we're maybe training them or supervising them. It's about really getting to know that professional. What are they bringing? What are their skill set? What do they find difficult? And how can we help them with that? So it's about finding a really personalized approach that fits the exact person that, that we are working with rather than teaching kind of a, a one size fits all system that ends up not fitting anybody. Okay, first of all, I'm just thinking on that a minute that's what she said joke, but never mind. Continue along. <laughs> you can imagine me how bad I am. Oh no, I, I am here. I am here for it. I love it. I love it. 
All right. Now, but I'm curious though, and all the serious side, what do you mean by flip from a, not like a one side side, but like a flip side or like a personalized side? What do you mean by that? Mm. What I mean by that is, you know, in the autism world, there are like some, you know, really big schools of therapy, like, you know, ABA, RDI. And often when I speak to parents, they feel like they're getting taught this system of when X happens, you do Y. When Y happens, you do Z. And we call it Z because we are English. And parents feel that that actually takes them out of relationship with their kids. It stops them relating to their kids because instead of really just responding to their children and having fun, they're thinking, oh, oh crap, you know, what, what, what am I supposed to do here? They did X, am I supposed to do Y? Am I supposed to do M? Am I supposed to do P? Ah! And it feels really restrictive. And then for the kids who are on the receiving end of that, no one likes being treated in that kind of like systematic way. We like being treated as human beings. So we really work with, you know, to use the example of parents, I would really work with a specific parent and say, okay, right, you know, let's really, really find out about your child. Let's find out about what they love. Let's find out about what their strengths are. Let's find out about what's difficult for them. And let's help you as the parent feel really, really confident in understanding when my child does this, oh, it's because of this reason. And so then here's a way to really help them with that. Here's a way to help them with that that is created specifically for that child, for what they love, what they find easy, what they are able to respond to. Right. And like I, right. And you'll, you'll find that one day parents, it's just, it may not be today, but it might be tomorrow. Right. And, you know, and I think this is the gift of having a professional who can come in and do this because, you know, look, parents are stressed. They are stressed and they are busy and they are tired. And so to be able to do this kind of, you know, slightly more creative thinking when their plate is already really, really full, that's tough. So I kind of feel like my job some of the time is, is to do the thinking so that parents can get on with the parenting. Correct. Now, I also want to talk about something I learned on your website, and it's an acronym, more, M.O.R.E. So what is yeah. this? And what does more mean to you? So more, this is a key concept that we teach in, in a lot of the training programs, the training groups that we run for parents with autistic children. It stands for motivation, optimism, relationship, and excitement. And this is the secret recipe for learning success, right? Oftentimes, we consider that people with autism have what we call a learning difficulty. And again, I really don't like that. Sorry, a learning disability and or learning disability or learning difficulty. And these are terms I really don't like. And I, so I say I, we have a learning difference. There's a different way that this child learns, but they can learn clearly. The reason why people seem like they have a learning disability is because we are not teaching in the way that they learn. We need to teach in the way that they learn. So that involves thinking about motivation, optimism, relationship, and excitement. We need to think about motivation. We need to think about, okay, am I making this learning moment fun for this person? Because if it's fun for them, they're gonna be more likely to engage with it. If it's not fun, it's not gonna go in. And that's true for everybody, whether they are autistic or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, Second. sir. Now, optimism. Wait. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I thought you were done. You can go ahead if you need to. Or if you're yeah, no, no. I was just going to go through each of the words really quickly. So motivation, optimism, which is about, you know, for me, as the person doing the teaching, do I believe that the person I'm teaching is going to be able to get it? Do I feel optimistic? Because if I don't, then why the hell am I doing it? And if mm -hmm. I don't feel optimistic, that's going to rub off on the kid they're going to pick up on that too. And that's not going to feel good for them. Then relationship, right? It's what we talked about through this whole podcast. A relationship has to be the heart of everything. Can I say to myself that my relationship with my child is more important than them learning this specific thing that I want them to learn? Because if I can say that, it takes the pressure off both of us. It stops it being all about, you got to learn, you got to change, you got to be different. 
And it lets it be more relaxed and saying, you know, even if you don't get it right now, that's okay, because we still have a great relationship. And that's the most important thing. Cor correct. The final part. Thank you. Yeah. The final part, which is saying excitement. Am I excited? Am I excited to help this person learn? Because again, if I'm not excited, if I'm bored by the thing that I'm potentially going to teach, that's also going to rub off on the person I'm trying to teach. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Now, where do you see optim autism, optimism, where do you see autism, optimism international going in the future? Yeah, you know, it is a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? Autism, optimism international. You have to try practice saying it a few times. Um, where do I see us going in the future? I, well, we're really expanding. So we launched a couple of years ago during COVID, which, which was fun. Um, we'd have a lot of online services for, for, like I said, for families, for other professionals, for, um, for companies, for employers who have neurodiverse employees. So I see us really hopefully expanding the training programs that we run for each of those three areas so that we're able to support people all around the world. But also we're, now that COVID is, um, well, it's not necessarily receding, but it seems to be becoming kind of, you know, safer to get out into the world again. We're starting to do much more in-person therapeutic work again. So I am out, I'm traveling around the world, I'm going to families, visiting them in their homes, um, working with families, working with their kids. And we're going to start running training for other play therapists so that there are more people who can go out and who can be supporting families, who can be supporting autistic people in their homes. To, because that's, that's where the magic really, really happens. Correct. And here's an idea. Maybe, I know you have videos, but why not? It's an idea. Why not? Because you're very passionate about play therapy and autism. Yeah. Why not start a podcast of your own? Well, that, that is in, in the works. We've got a very long list of all the things we want to make happen. But yeah, I think a podcast could be really fun. I think a podcast would definitely help. I think just, just from a business standpoint, I think your company could benefit from that. Well, that's a great idea. You know, maybe we'll start one and maybe we'll have you on it. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not going anywhere yet, at least. Um, <laughs> so I want to know also, can you tell us, I want to tell your team, because I see you're not the only one being a play therapist and there's other people working there. So can you tell us who else is on the team? Right. So there's, there's me. I'm, I'm the director of, well, we call it AOI for short, Autism Optimism International. Um, so I'm a psychologist and I'm a consultant play therapist. I have an amazing colleague called Kim Corpody. She's actually based in the USA. She's another um, play therapy consultant. We have um, Dr. Natty Triskel, who is our senior content um, consultant. So she is a very, very experienced retired clinical psychologist here in the UK. She helps out with creating the content for the training programs that we run. And then we have, I call her our admin angel. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman called Ashley Gallimore. She helps us out with all the administrative stuff because I will be honest with you, I'm good at the play therapy stuff. I'm not so good at the paperwork stuff. So Ashley takes care of all the paperwork for us. She does all like the, the office stuff of getting everything scheduled, making sure that notes are written up and sent out to our clients. You know, she, she's just the, the glue that holds it all together. That, that's good. I'll have to tell you that. That's why I'm an editor. I can't, I can't do money. I cannot do finances because it is too complicated because the numbers keep switching on you. Next thing you know, there's eight times five. Then you got to add three. My question is, how do you get to that? I don't think finances teaches us how do you get to 80 and then to 30. <clears throat> Absolutely. <clears throat> I never got taught how to do my taxes in school. So I'm very, very glad that we've been able to bring Ashley on board to help us out with all that stuff. Oh, yeah. they. I'm glad those people exist because they need to. Believe me. Yeah. And again, it goes back to that point of everybody living their own best lives and that's different for everyone. I think for a long time, I had an expectation that I should be able to do all these things, but realizing actually my brain works in a particular way. I've got a particular set of skills. Ashley's brain works in a different way. And it's great because our skills are really compatible. She does the stuff that I'm not so good at. Right, and when two and two mate together, it makes the dream, it makes the dream team. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, 
at AOI, we are all about building dream teams. Right. Now, how does your team try to stand out and make their legacy at AOI? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think it's something that we're still developing. So we are trying to put much more stuff out in social media. We try to get a lot of video content out there for people so that there's a lot of free advice and free support that we are putting out. But something that we're really aware of is that we are all neurotypical people. And so one of the big things that we're gonna put in place this year is we're actually gonna bring in an advisory board that has on it some parents, that has on it some autistic people. I would really love it if we could have a couple of non-speaking autistic people on there. So that for everything that we create, every training program that we offer, we can actually kind of you know, run it past the people who we would be using it with and see, you know, how does this feel for you? Does this feel respectful? Does this feel okay? Or does this feel like it would be disrespectful mm. or, or unhelpful in some way? I, I think I have some I have I have some connections I might be able to get you upon with and we might they might be able to be on the board. I know someone who might might be interested. I'm not for sure, but I it might work out. That's I'll incredible. probably do that to the podcast you. for you. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Now I also want to talk about I noticed you have one on one sessions and group sessions. So are there any similarities and differences between the one on one sessions and the group sessions you do? Mm. So the one-on-one -on -one sessions is really where we get to do all of this really, really personalized kind of stuff that, that we were just talking about. In the group sessions, another thing that we really try to do a lot is, especially when working with, with parents, you know, I've been kind of referring repeatedly to how we, we have to look at ourselves and we have to look at our own emotions and what gets triggered for us when we're trying to help people. And obviously for parents, there are a lot of really difficult emotions that can come up, you know, whether that is fear for their kid's future or, you know, maybe feeling sad about their children's diagnoses. And we want to create safe spaces for parents to be able to talk about those feelings and to be able to look at them and maybe be able to start gently shifting some of them. And what we found is doing that in a group with other parents is the best place because you're with people who have the same kind of experiences and the same kind of feelings as you and these feelings can can be really difficult to talk about so when we're in a group with other people who feel similar ways who can relate to us and who can understand to us it creates that kind of safety so we're running more groups now that are in a way kind of therapy groups for parents to be able to share how they feel to have it be met with empathy and with understanding and for us to then also start thinking about well here's maybe a way that we could feel differently about this so we're creating more room for that that understanding with our children correct and i think when i was in a camp i wasn't i got invited to a camp once upon a time and then i when i went there, i realized these people are me they're they have the same struggles I, there's someone out there who may not be me but is very, can relate to me in some ways. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, you know, feeling um, like we are seen is one of the most healing experiences for, for everybody. And so one of the things that I absolutely see to be true is that when parents feel more supported, they are then able to offer better support for their kids. So we do, yeah, absolutely, a ton of like one-to-one -one work where we work in detail with families, but also there's a lot of families who we support through these group programs. So the parents really, really feel like their emotional needs can get listened to and attended to so that they can then go and be the kind of parent that they want to be for their kids. Mm -hmm, I agree with that. Now, we'll be right back, everyone. Listeners out there, thanks for tuning in. But we got to hear an ad from Unlocking the Spectrum. So let's get to it.
At Unlocking the Spectrum, we are committed to making the highest quality ABA therapy accessible to all children with autism. We pride ourselves in offering fun, compassionate, and data-driven programs for individuals with autism and unparalleled support for their families. Our personalized approach means that every unique child is given just what they need to reach their maximum potential. We are so happy to support Sam in his mission of taking the stigma off of autism. You can learn more about our services and employment opportunities in both Indiana and Texas at unlockingthespectrum.com or by calling 855-INFO-UTS. That's 855-INFO-UTS. All right, and we're back. And yes, be sure to check them out because they will unlock the key to success for you. Now, Jack, I also want to talk about your YouTube channel. So what is your YouTube channel about and how can people find it? Oh, well, the YouTube channel is a place where, like I said, so we're trying to put out more videos where we are talking about, you know, kind of little tips, little strategies that are going to be able to support people. So one of the things that I did back at the start of COVID was we ran a month long support program for families with autistic kids. And it was really actually based a lot on helping parents be able to look after themselves, right? Because there at the heart of all our work is this idea of if parents feel supported, they can then support their kids better. So Many, many years ago, I also actually trained as a yoga teacher and a meditation teacher. And so I made a whole load of videos of like little quick three minute yoga poses, little three minute meditations for, for kind of calmness, for relaxation, because we know parents don't have a ton of time available. So we wanted to create a whole load of videos that people could easily integrate into their day so that they had, you know, maybe just three minutes of being able to take care of themselves. So YouTube is something that we're going to start populating more and more with videos for advice, videos for self-care, videos explaining different techniques, different tools for being able to help our kids, and hopefully even videos where things like this, where we do interviews, we do talks with autistic people who can really share about their experience and, and where we can learn from you. Yeah, and you, the learning is the best experience of all time because... You'll take something and then you're going to improve yourself. So for sure, I think that'll be a great tool for you. And I can't wait to see what it will provide you and what the videos will provide you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. But I would say for right now, YouTube isn't the main place where we're putting stuff. The main places right now are Facebook and Instagram. So if people want to kind of, you know, snap up the, the tips and the things that we're putting out, Facebook and Instagram are the places to go. Correct. And I, I think it is mine too. So I also oh, nice. want to talk to you about, you said that when I was speaking after, in the beginning of your speech, your speech is on YouTube as well, by the way. I don't know if you knew that or not. I will have to go look that up. It, it, it is. I, that's, I found it. They don't have mine though, but they have yours. So huh? darn uh -huh. you, Jack. But anyway. Oh, we'll have to chase up yours. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. I know. But um, you said two things you liked in the, during the beginning. One, you loved when I said redefining success. So- what stood out about what stood out about that to you when I said that? Yeah, so if I remember um, what you had said, or I think I, I can't remember if you said it or if your mom said it, but it was something like redefining success. You are successful not because of what you've done, but because you're you. And I love that because again, it goes back to this whole idea of, um, am I prioritizing my child learning something and achieving something over my relationship with them? Can I think that actually my child is amazing and brilliant just as they are? And, you know, yeah, sure. I might still want to help them learn things and that could be really useful and important, but that doesn't mean that they're better or that they're more successful if they learn those things. They are brilliant and valid and wonderful and enjoyable as a person, just as they are. That's the doorway into having the best relationships with our kids. Right. And really redefining success, as I said once in an interview, I think last night on or on the news on my local news channel was mm -hmm. success is what you make of it. And success can be anything from getting the mail or even owning a mansion, they're both the same. It's not one over the other. Right. It's about mindset. 
And again, that's another thing we talk about with parents and, and with professionals a lot, because we can have a mindset that success as a parent means that your kid's always happy or that your kid's scoring the highest grade in school or success as a professional means that every single thing that you do with your clients works and you never make any mistakes. And that's just, it's not true. It's not human. It's not how any of us live. Sometimes success looks like just being able to get out of bed in the morning, right? Sometimes success looks like I showed up today. I wasn't able to do anything more than that, but I showed up. Right. You need to celebrate the baby steps. Yeah. Baby steps are still steps. Yes, sir. Also, the other thing I know that stood out to you was you like when I said stretching ourselves outside the comfort zone. So why is it? So what about that stood out to you when I said that? Yeah. You got such a great memory, Sam. <laughs> I'd forgotten I said well, all one, these things. One was the video, but two I remembered visually. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Um, Which I'll post stretch. in the show notes for my listeners, but go ahead, I decided to say that. Yeah, no, amazing. Um, stretching outside our comfort zone. I think, you know, when I'm working with autistic people, I'm really aware that I'm asking them to stretch outside their comfort zone. That maybe by, you know, trying a food they've never tried before or learning a particular kind of like conversation skill that maybe has been really challenging for them. So who am I to say that they're the only ones who have to go outside their comfort zone? I also want to go outside my comfort zone because I want to show them like, look, whatever you are being asked to do, I'm going to do that too. I'm not going to make it all about you having to do the difficult stuff. I'm going to do difficult stuff as well. Right. We're in it together. It's a journey we share, not only your journey, our journey. 100%, right? And sometimes our journey, or meaning my journey or the journey for whoever is, you know, the therapist or parent or professional, sometimes that journey is the internal work. It's the internal stretching of, okay, can I stretch my ability to be comfortable with this? Can I stretch my ability to not need my child to be different? Can I stretch my ability to understand someone who is maybe really, really different to me? Because if I can do that, then I can be more present and I can relate better. And that's going to be more helpful for them. Right. And as my mom always says, though, different than what, though? Right. I mean, we are all different. Correct. I also want to ask you now, there's some out there who also may not stretch me and be like, yeah, it's my way. I'm doing it this way. I'm going this way. He has to go this way too. Yeah. What would you tell those though who refuse to stretch? Ooh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I guess I would be really curious to know why. Why don't they want to stretch? Well, because I'll I tell you off- one. I think you had to deal with one at the conference. I remember, I don't, I'm not going to say names and I'm not saying it was bad, but it was mm. a grandfather. I don't know if you remember that, but he asked a question of like my grandson who is nonverbal is on the spectrum and he stems on the floor rocking yeah. back and forth. And at first I thought you jerk, but then I thought, wait a minute, that's not me. I shouldn't be like that. He just doesn't know. That's why we're here. But he refused mm. to stretch almost. I feel as if, and you you said you asked him why and i remember yeah. he said because he was uncomfortable and right. my first thought was obviously like not a, a nice thought but then i thought that's just who he is he doesn't know he's from a different generation he's learned now though not to do that and i'm very proud of him for doing that but now he knows that's why we're here and now that yeah. he's uncomfortable and he was very honest about that he probably isn't he probably at least maybe still be uncomfortable but he understands why he's doing it now. And that's why he came today. I'm very happy he did. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that you remember that. That felt like a really important moment because I think if we can extend this idea of trying to understand rather than judge, if we can extend that idea to anybody, then it opens up opportunities for conversation. And that opens up opportunities to change. So if someone doesn't want to stretch, and I don't feel this way 100% of the time. Some of the times I definitely do get judgmental because I'm, I'm human. But 
if I'm working with someone and they, they don't want to stretch, my immediate curiosity is why? What's getting in the way? Because my, my experience tells me that when people don't want to stretch, it's because they're scared. Well, and that, that's, that could have been possible with him. But part of me, you know, Jack kind of thinks it's a generation thing. You know, back in the yeah. 60s, 70s, no one stretched. They flat out refused to. Right. But I think even then, even if it's a generational thing, it comes down to fear. It comes down to fear of the unknown, that this is not something I've ever done before. So it feels scary. It feels unfamiliar. Maybe I feel, maybe I'm scared I'm going to lose my power. I'm going to lose my control. Um, and when we can help people really connect to that, that actually underneath our rigidity is fear, then again, we can start to relate to people a bit more deeply and we can start to help people see that, okay, this thing that you're scared of maybe actually isn't so scary. No, it's not scary. It's the bowels within you. Yeah, absolutely. So when we can lead with non-judgment, when we can lead with curiosity, you know, that's helpful for everybody. I agree. And I also want to talk about your family. So what were your family's thoughts when you told them you were going to be a play therapist and how did they support you? That's such a lovely question. When I told them I wanted to be a play therapist, they were immediately like, yeah, that makes sense. hundred <laughs> percent. We're behind you. We support you doing this. Um, they have always been really, really supportive of my work. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm very, very lucky that my family has actually always been very, very supportive of me. They've really talked about, you know, prioritizing relationships first and being understanding. Um, that is always how my parents have, have been with me. And I think as an adult now, I really feel the benefit of that because I feel very free and able to be myself. Right. For sure. Because I feel like with when it comes to you, they may have building your roots up a bit. Yeah. For your play therapy. So fate, totally. fate comes again with having your parents. Yeah, absolutely. You know, our relationship with our primary caregivers is so powerful, you know. And, um, you know, funny fact, my mom, she's retired now, but, you know, going back a few years, she was actually an educational psychologist here in, in the UK. And her academic area of interest, her research was all about learning through play. So I kind of feel like I'm just, I'm just kind of continuing the family tradition now. I think so. You're building the legacy of the good old, the good dolls, right? Well, my mom is a good old. My dad is the Mason. I took both their names. Oh. Mason so Goodall. you're building the Mason good dolls, right? Yeah, that's what we're doing. Awesome. Now, I also, one of your personal interests is what it sounded like to me, because you talked about singing Disney all the time, so... <laughs> <laughs> what about Disney attracts you? Oh my gosh. Uh, oh my gosh. Um, well, like I said, I'm very musical. So as a little kid, I loved all the Disney songs. So I grew up with like, you know, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Aladdin. They, they have brilliant songs. They have such great songs. Um, Be Prepared is the best Disney song I think out there still to this day. Ooh. You know what? I might have to fight you on that one. I think I would probably say it's Under the Sea from The Little Mermaid. Mm. But hey, we're, we're allowed to disagree, right? Right, right. As long as you yeah. do it civilly. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I just love those songs. I started singing them as soon as I was able to sing, and I, I never stopped. Wow, that's awesome. Now, out of curiosity, who's your favorite Disney character and why? Oh, my gosh. That's it's Scar for a... me. I'll be honest. It's Scar. Yeah? Why? Lion King. I think sometimes I, I fight for the villains for than the heroes because I think sometimes the villains can be relatable and sometimes the villains aren't all that bad. You know, the villains can be really fun, can't they? Um, oh, my gosh. This is such a difficult question. Whew. Let me think. I think... My favorite Disney character is Ursula from The Little Mermaid. That's a good one. I've heard. Yeah. I've heard about her. She's definitely an evil person, but she definitely is motivated. I think you can tell that. Yeah. And, she, and she's just very fun. 
I, I, I think, yeah. And she's got a great song. Exactly. But I'm now, this is just from a personal standpoint. How <laughs> has Disney helped you throughout your life when you came through all the tough times and the challenges? And if so, how? Huh. You know, I'm, I'm sure it probably has. I don't know if I can think of like a really specific example right here in this moment. But I know that um, a lot of the time, kind of, you know, from when I was eight through to when I was sort of 16, 17, I felt like quite an outsider at school. I felt very different to the other kids. I was very different to the other kids. And um, one of my other favorite Disney movies, which is, it's not a very popular one. It's not very well known. It's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And um, I think I always loved it because the main character, Quasimodo, the hunchback, um, is, is a real outsider. And there was something that I think kind of, I could really empathize with there. Well, that, that's cool. I'm, I was like you with that pro wrestling, though. I mm. mean, when I had a bad day and I just felt basically awful about myself, about the day I had, about the people there, when I want to get mad at them, I just go to pro wrestling and just feel at ease and it made me calm down. So pro wrestling was my best friend. Really yeah. was. They, I had yeah. to get taken away though from me because I act out the moves and you can imagine me how that was at an eight year old, but. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I, I want to be careful with that one. <laughs> I had to get that. I, I was very limited to it at the childhood. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the same way with you and Disney or be able to control yourself with it. Or did your mom have to tell you, be quiet, we're enough Disney? Oh, my mom definitely had to tell me that many times. My mom does not like Disney. So. <laughs> yes. I don't think that she, uh, I don't think she ever kind of, you know, fully, fully joined me in my, my love of Disney. Dang her, right? Mm-hmm. Now, all right, so these are just for some fun questions. So, Jack, what is, like, your favorite food or paradise meal, and why is it your favorite? Well, favorite food would be chocolate. Absolutely. Um, chocolate bars or just chocolate milk or what chocolate exactly, I guess. Ooh. Uh, is it too big of a, ch or is it too big of a challenge? You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not fussy. <laughs> I don't like Hershey's. I, I don't like Hershey's, but um, there's a chocolate brand called Green and Blacks. That's like, it's a, it's a little bit more kind of upmarket chocolate, but um, that's really good. Ah, but, but a paradise meal would probably be... It can involve chocolate. Some, well, yeah, there would definitely be chocolate for dessert. Um, my dad makes this amazing um, pasta with chicken and rosemary that is just like, oh, ever since like I first had it as a little kid, it's just like my, my comfort meal. Every time I go home to visit my parents, um, well, not every time, but quite often they cook it for me. Oh, they, that, that's wonderful. I'll tell you this, I'm the, if you ever come to Amer come to my place, you'll see me yeah. eating a lot of uh, wings, chicken wings. Those oh, are my favorite. Lot yeah. Of, make it the harder, the better for me though. I'll be honest. Spicy. The, oh, really? I love the spicy, like the spicy, the heisey, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And are, are you uh, a ranch guy? Are you yep, a ranch? Yeah. Nice. So now out of curiosity, what is your favorite movie or TV show and why do you like it? So my favorite TV show, um, it's a very silly one. It's called Drag Race. And it's like a reality TV. It's a bit like America's Next Top Model, but it's for drag queens. And it, I find it hysterical. And partly because, you know, like drag queens are often amazing comedians. So they are just like cracking the most funny jokes but also because these people are incredible artists. Like they sew these amazing costumes. They do this phenomenal makeup. They can sing, they can dance, they can act, they can tell jokes. They're just so talented. They're but all in one. Lot... That's the cool part, right? Right. They are all in one. And they're all people generally who've overcome real hardship, you know, whether that's been, you know, that they've been rejected by their families because of being LGBTQ whether that's because they face discrimination because of the kind of work they do. Um, you know, there's just really amazing, inspiring stories from the contestants on that show as well. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. And I bet sometimes you're happy when that show comes on. Do you still watch every once oh, in a while? 
Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, not just once in a while. I, I will binge that show. <laughs> yes. Oh, I binge shows too. I'm not, it's sometimes my guilty pleasure. Yeah. Not that show in particular, but some shows. You know, I think it's really important that we have some guilty pleasures and, and that we let ourselves indulge them. Correct. Now, what has been your favorite vacation that you have ever taken? And why did you enjoy that vacation very much? And I don't, it can be a workcation. It could be one that you just traveled in the America, Britain, your call, you want to answer it. Yeah. Ooh, you know, I'm really lucky because with my work, I've been able to travel all over the world. I work with families all over the place. I do a lot of work in India and I love India. It's such an amazing country. You know, it's incredible food, incredible colors, incredible people you know so so warm so friendly so um inclusive but also the countryside is amazing so i took a trip up into the himalayas to go visit the river ganges which was magical um so so i think india is probably my favorite country that that i've ever been to well i bet i bet it seems fun and the food there you said it's pretty good what food did you eat there oh the food is amazing my mouth is watering just thinking about it and um so many different sorts of food and what's what i love about india one of the many things i love is every different area nearly every different town has its own particular style of cooking so you could be up in the north say like in in delhi and have particular sorts of food and then you go down to the south and it's completely completely different uh so yeah i i love that but hey the variety is the best part because you maybe feel you could do one, northern one day and then the southern the next day. Variety is the right. best, isn't it, some days? It is the spice of life. It is. Now, the final question is, are there any good memories that you want to tell our viewers about? If you do, why do you remember that memory the most? Now, before you answer, I always want to end with like a good memory that made you feel good inside and then a funny memory that made you fall on the floor. That could be involving <laughs> your work. That could involve just yourself. Your client yeah. want to answer both. Okay. Um, hmm. All right. Let's, let's think. Ah, so a good memory, you know, it's, I, I guess it's maybe not even so much a specific memory as like, it's a series of memories, but it's, it's about a young man who I work with and, uh, he has a diagnosis of autism. I've been working with him now for 14 years, so a really long time that I've known him and his family. And I feel so blessed as a professional to have been able to have such a long relationship with, with someone, with, with a family, with this young man. So there are so many memories there of, of working with him. But I think now it's just really about that I have such a great relationship with him. We know each other so well. There's so much warmth. There's so much kind of, you know, appreciation that I have of him and that he expresses of me. And it, it's, yeah, it's an incredibly wonderful, rewarding thing to, to think about that. That's awesome. You seem like you two made a friendship and that's what's beautiful. Yeah, very, very much so. Very much so. And then, um, hmm. A relationship. Oh, sorry, a relationship. <laughs> I'm getting my my words mixed up. A memory that makes me laugh. Huh. Well, I don't know why this is necessarily coming to my mind, but this is sort of a a story that my family tells. Um, of a family holiday that we took to Canada when I was maybe 14. And, um, and I think the reason why it makes me laugh is because I was, I could be quite dramatic. I, I could be a bit melodramatic sometimes in, in how I react to things. And so <laughs> we were in Canada. I was wearing sandals. And at one point we were staying in a caravan park and I trod on a wasp. And this wasp stung the, like the sole of my foot maybe like two or three times. And so the way that my family tells this story then is I literally run screaming back into the caravan. And then my mom comes to like try to 
take the the sandal off my shoe off my foot so um so that she can like you know check out the stings my mom's name is Olwen um it's a Welsh name and I just scream at her get your hands off me Olwen <laughs> and, you know normally normally I'm a pretty peaceful pretty chilled guy but like when when I go off I I clearly really go off <laughs> so um yeah I, I find that funny now. Oh, when, like, that's a fun. That's that is kind of funny because when you think when I say that, I think of Frozen. Get your get your shoes off me, Olaf. That's nice. Oh thing. right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, the only thing is though, she wasn't made out of snow. I don't think. No, she definitely wasn't. No. All right, or I don't think she had a carrot for her nose. I don't think. <laughs> I don't think she was a snow woman. No, you know, I've known my mom a long time. I think. I think. Um, I feel pretty certain she's not a snow woman. Hey, you never know. They'll half human, half snow woman. You never know at the same time. Well, yeah, there you go. Maybe I'll have to just go and sort of like put her near a fire for a bit and see what Yeah, happens. exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm melting, <laughs> but I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Jack, I think that's all. It's been fun. Is there anything you want, any closing remarks or anything you want to promote before we head out of here? Yeah, I mean, first of all, just thank you so much for having me on. I've had a blast. Um, you know, if people want to check out the work that we do, they can go to our website, which is www.autismoptimisminternational.com. You can check us out on Facebook and on Instagram, which is at Autism Optimism International. And like I said, you know, those are the places where we are putting out a, a, a ton of stuff, ton of information so yeah get in touch we would love to hear from you all right well thank you again i'll probably post the autism optimism website in the show notes as well along with my blogs that i put i'll put in there so you'll have that but thank you again and as i said earlier it's been wonderful having you and i hope you have a good day oh thank you so much sam it's a pleasure